Hi. Um, on air. So I think we are live. Hi, my name is uh, Ben White. I'm trying to move the slide. There we go. My name is uh, Ben White. I'm chair of Libra's Copyright and Legal Matters uh, Working Group. So good morning and thank you everyone for uh, attending this morning. So we've got two excellent speakers lined up. Um, one um, from Ghent University, Inga, and uh, my colleague on the Copyright Working Group, Alex, from Birmingham University. And they will be talking all about how uh, their libraries have started to support um, text and data mining in the different ways and, and hopefully we'll hear sort of some of the issues that they've been working through. So I guess the um, context of the webinar um, is uh, the two new exceptions that we have in the Digital Single Market Directive, the amended Copyright Directive. Um, and Article 3 is, is focused particularly on, um, on re research organisations. And I would um, urge you, uh, I don't, it will be interesting to see if it comes out in either Inga or Alex's talk. Uh, Lieber on Tuesday this week launched um, the results of a survey that we'd, we had done um, where publishers have uh, blocked um, access to electronic resources. Uh, that universities have been subscribed to. So if you look in the chat, um, I think Friedel will cut and paste the link, but it's on the homepage of the Libra website at the moment. And I personally think this is, you know, now we've had some legal change, um, this may be one of the main blockers of actually enabling um, text and data mining in the, in, in the university environment. Um, on average, we found that, um, there it is in, in, in the attendee chat, um, we found on average that uh, it took nearly a month, 23 days, for access to be reinstalled at the university. Um, and the worst case was two and a half months. So if you, if you look at the report, we contrast this quite markedly with if you have a problem with iTunes or Netflix, where as a consumer paying very small amounts of money, you'll be reconnected very, very quickly. However, in a university environment where you are potentially spending hundreds of thousands of euros on an electronic resource, it is taking weeks, if not months. So I would draw your attention to that. Um, just housekeeping rules. The webinar is being recorded. We're going to share. You can find the recording on the Libra channel in you on youtube um soon I don't, i'm not sure when but pretty soon um so i'm going to hand over now to inga who will talk for about 15 to 20 minutes and then alex and then we're aiming for 10 to 15 minutes worth of discussion so if you've got any questions that arise please please put them in in the chat so inga over to you and, and welcome hi ben uh, thank you for your welcoming message. I hope uh, you hear me well, um, and thanks for inviting me. Um, just to pick up on where you left, so I'm from Ghent University Library, which is in Belgium. And uh, in Belgium, we are still in the transition phase of implementing the new copyright directive. So we don't have it in our laws yet, but it should be arranged in the next few months, um, I'm being told. So uh, this, as a, as a quick... Uh, update on, on what the situation is here in Belgium. So we don't have the legal instrument yet, but it's soon to come. Now, as I said, uh, I work at the Book Tower in Ghent University, uh, where I am uh, the coordinator of scholarly communications, which means I'm uh, going over open science, copyright and information literacy. Uh, of course, the three are very very, very well combined <laughs> together. Um, now here at the, uh, uh, what you also should know is that in the Book Tower, the university library is part of a library network within the university, where the Book Tower is the central, central service embedded uh, in, the, um, in the central administration in the research affairs group. So 
that is very, actually a very good part for us to be. Certainly also if you think about TDM, um, we are part of the research affairs and all the other libraries in the network are faculty libraries and they are actually uh, within the faculties. Uh, so decisions and appointing people and everything is decided within the faculties, but we form one network. I wanted to make that clear uh, from the start. Uh, now, since we are part of uh, the research uh, department, central uh, department, and not only because of that, because of many reasons, uh, we have uh, an important mission being facilitating open knowledge creation. We are uh, with our two feet within the community, within the research community, and we try to help them as much as possible. When we talk about facilitating, we support, we are not researchers ourselves, we don't have a research unit. Um, OPEN has been uh, a key in our strategy since nearly two decades, from the early 2000s. Uh, it was really a basic uh, feature. Um, we have been um, testing and experimenting with interoperability APIs, these kinds of things in the from the beginning of the 2000s. Um, and then now uh, we talk about uh, knowledge in the last few years and not only about information because uh, it's about the whole research cycle. Uh, we want to support the whole research cycle, all research artifacts, um, not only literature, but also data, also uh, software and all these kinds of things. Uh, and uh, as said, we work together closely with uh, researchers uh, in creation. I must say, in many cases it's especially in the digital humanity humanities digital humanities um, we try to think with the researcher how we can help them to optimize use of our collections on one hand and secondly on how we can optimize reuse and uh, of their data and these kind of things uh, now what it concerns TDM, text and data mining. Uh, as said, uh, as a library, we have been involved in openness and uh, fair data for quite some time. Well, fair data is the, the word that we only used the last few years, but actually that's uh, what we have been doing uh, for ages. But really going into text and data mining ourselves, being with the two feet in the field, let's say, uh, that's uh, only the last few years that we, we get more and more engaged, but this is really a field that we have to invest, invest much more. Now, as a library, as I said, uh, we want to make our collection first, uh, we want to make the collection mineable because uh, our collection is actually data of uh, a lot of researchers who make use of our collection. And on the other hand, uh, as I said, we support our researchers in making their own data available and mineable and fair. That's, that's a basic thing, actually. So with our open catalog, we make sure that we have uh, lots of exports available, data dumps, but uh, also through the APIs, of course, uh, persistent identifiers for every item in our collections. Um, so there is a persistent identifier already for, for quite some years. Uh, that's a first step to make sure that people can reuse it. And we have uh, quite some open interfaces that people can use, like IIIF, which I will touch upon later, Open Search, uh, OAI, PMH. So those are three of the, of the most important ones. Uh, now, we have a big image database. We have been digitizing a lot of material. Uh, in the last few years, and um, we made it all available openly through our website. Um, but as you all know very well, for text and data mining purposes, it's not enough to just to put it on your website. You have to do more things with it. You want them uh, also images to be uh, mineable, uh, let's say. So um, uh, we offer quite some services there, and uh, that's in the first example that I want to address um, when we talk about uh, text and data mining. Um, we use uh, IIIF in the last few years. Uh, we got to know this initi initiative from the start, actually, when it was still called uh, Shared Canvas, and it was uh, still in a project phase uh, about seven years ago. It was through Robert Sanderson that we, we got to know uh, this uh, uh, this framework. Um, we immediately saw it's a potential, but at the beginning it was a bit, it didn't really get off uh, that quickly, but at a certain moment IIIF was, uh, was started. 
And um, they started because much of the internet's image-based resources are locked up in silos, in, in typical uh, homemade, locally built um, interfaces, applications. And uh, it was very difficult to combine images and to, um, to mine them and, and do interesting stuff with them. So um, image repositories embarked on, on an effort to collaboratively produce an interoperable technology and a community framework for uh, image delivery. Um, and yeah, standardization here is key. And that is what uh, IIIF um, uh, does. It, it defines a set of common APIs that support interoperability between image repositories. Don't only think about heritage images here, because we have seen examples of uh, medicine, um, which also uses uh, this kind of image uh, framework for uh, images, uh, scan images and, and stuff like that. So it's not only heritage, it's, it's more than that. Uh, now, when you look at it from a TCM perspective, it's yeah beyond the user interface, uh, IIIF is very machine driven. Uh, not uh, not the the human user driven. It's programmable. It's accessible live uh, live on the web. Uh, it's compliant with with a lot of standards, um, and it, of course, like every uh, service in in that matter, it it requires persistent identifiers. But what Triple I F does with persistent identifiers that's uh, the interesting uh, thing uh, to do. Of course, having a persistence identifier for one image is uh, is logical, uh, but when you start zooming in and copying uh, little pieces of, of an image uh, that you want to refer to in presentations, in papers, etc., it becomes more difficult. You want this piece to be citable and, and retrievable from the web. And with the IIIF image API, you have this structure to arise for images. And uh, you can really see in a very structural way which part of a manuscript is, or an image, sorry, an image. Uh, it was of, because of this image, that, uh, uh, which is a manuscript that I thought about uh, manuscript. Uh, you can see very well where uh, the part of the image is situated and uh, on what uh, people are uh, annotating or, or things like that. And this is not only um, humans that can do that, uh, the machinery can detect those uh, persistent links and, and work with it. So citing and sharing is, a, is, a, is an important uh, feature here. Um, combining of content, uh, because we all know that not only for heritage collections, but also for other collections, you have images scattered all over the world and you want to bring them together in a virtual uh, environment and IIIF provides that. And then there's also a layer of annotation. You can add a layer of annotation so that you can uh, very um, easily connect a, a piece of an image, which is actually a sentence in, in a manuscript, for example, and add the annotation. You have seen that this IIIF uh, Standard uh, is, is, a, is a very convenient way of working. Now I talked about these, uh, this persistent identifier and there is an image here, uh, an image that you can find on the IIIF website as well, um, that indicates how these uh, bits work and how it looks uh, in, in the code. Uh, you can see uh, here's an example of, of a sentence in a manuscript. You see the uh, typed, let's say, version uh, of the whole sentence, and then you can see uh, the, the exact link to that piece of uh, information uh, in a link. So um, this, uh, this helps a lot in, in the reusability of uh, image databases. Now, we don't only experiment with IIIF and provide a service here in-house. We really want researchers or research uh, heritage institutions, etc., to use this powerful, uh, this powerful framework. So we set up um, Shared Canvas as uh, the whole name of uh, IIIF. Uh, it's a service for, uh, from Ghent University Library. They provide a server, triple IF, and an interface for image management so that you can uh, use this uh, 
all together and we help the researchers uh, to start using the service. But we have seen that it is not easy to get researchers to use such new services, although digital humanities is all over the place. Um, but uh, we are working on it to get more and more researchers involved in, in uh, these kind of services, or to, that they can make use of it. So we try to, to work out projects together with researchers where we have uh, where we act as a partner in projects so that we can assist researchers in using these new tools and um, and that we can support facilitate their uh, research so that is a first example of uh, where we support uh, better uh, tdm on our collections and how we support our researchers in, in, in getting involved in that um, uh, a second example, which is uh, maybe not especially for researchers, but it's an example of TDM, is uh, what we do with our repository. Um, now, repositories all over the world are uh, the first places where, where data management, for example, started. Um, and of course, as every uh, repository, we have uh, quite some satellite APIs, uh, uh, pits, uh, persistent identifiers. Um, and I want to highlight this not uh, for our repository, which is not so very different from many others, but I want to make the link to what we do with TDM in open air, an open air project. Um, now to, uh, to make repositories interoperable and mineable, uh, you need these standards APIs met, meta, with a lot of metadata, and a lot of text, uh, DOIs, handles, ORCIDs, you name it, you all have it in your repositories. Um, and we provide quite some uh, downloads and APIs options there, but that is not the main thing. We also attach machine readable licenses like Creative Commons licenses if they are provided, if we have them uh, for our uh, open access uh, articles because it's very important in a text and data mining environment that you know what you can do with uh, with all this information in these repositories uh, but we still learn because uh, we, just recently I, I had a question for our legal advisor on uh, creative commons licenses uh, when you have Creative Commons licenses uh, with the 3.0 version and then 4.0 version and how they relate to each other and how you indicate that in your repository and how difficult it becomes to have a complete list of uh, Creative Commons licenses, for example, for your users to choose um, to make sure that for, that it's machine readable what the rights are for, for these, uh, for these uh, publications. Uh, but this is also an important part in the, in the repository. Now, if you look at open air, open air, which is the open access infrastructure for research in Europe, um, open air harvests many, many uh, repositories all over uh, Europe and beyond. Um, open air is used by several funders uh, for, for example, monitoring services, which is uh, uh, mined uh, for that. And um, and it, uh, but it still has to be discovered for 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 research purposes, I think. I think much more can be done with the information in open air, in research paper, uh, in research environment, and, and yeah, using text and data mining techniques, because there's a lot of information in there. Because many of the data providers of open air, um, which, of which you see if you hear CRISP platforms, software repositories, data archives, and of course the publishing uh, platforms, um, they come, um, they comply to guidelines that Open Air has, uh, has issued, which is based on uh, standard uh, APIs. Um, and um, uh, through these guidelines, uh, these uh, harvesters, um, the, the harvest through Open Air, uh, you can have more, uh, you can have better data uh, in, in your environment, of course. Now, what Open Air does through harvesting all these data sources at, is that you uh, create a big open science graph, which is mineable, which is uh, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and reusable, um, with millions and millions of, uh, of information in it. Open Air itself mines uh, 10 million PDFs 
to add more information to the data within uh, open air. Now, um, and then creating a, a big open air research graph. Now, this research graph uh, has a lot of elements in it, uh, including, of course, ORCID uh, identifiers. Uh, you see uh, a lot of information, um, a lot of data coming in from data side, from uh, repositories, of course, in our institutions, uh, but also the DOIJ, for example. So lots of information coming together. And Open Air itself mines a lot of information from uh, other uh, services to enrich uh, the information in Open Air. So a lot of te text and data mining is going on there. Um, and uh, this uh, research graph is actually the basis of uh, one of the one of the bases of uh, the next uh, European Open Science Cloud. In the European Open Science Cloud, it will be uh, crucial um, uh, that the metadata is clear and is qualitative, uh, so that researchers can text and data mine a, a lot of data repositories all over Europe and beyond, um, as uh, you can already do in Open Air. Um, so the better our repositories are connected, the be better our, connect, uh, our repositories um, assist in text and data mining, which you can do with the, the things I have already said, uh, the better they appear in these kind of services like Open Air, like European Open Science Cloud, and the better the researchers can mine uh, this information. Um, now, reliable metadata is uh, reliable data, of course, but is is key, and and that is where the library has uh, an important uh, part. We have to provide qualitative uh, metadata. We have to provide uh, qualitative data support researchers in getting their data fair uh, and getting their data out there, and that it is uh, mineable. That is what we have to do as libraries. I won't talk now about uh, licenses that we have with commercial providers, uh, uh, that will, uh, but you will hear that uh, in the next presentation. Um, but we have to make sure as a library that we provide qualitative data and that people can rely on that. And so if you look at the influence on our library staff, we already always had metadata specialists, we called them catalogers before, um, so that we still have to invest in those metadata uh, specialists. Um, I know at the end of the 90s, this, uh, we all thought uh, that the web would solve our metadata issues, but uh, already a few years later, it was clear that it was not the case, but we have gaps in the now catalog because of those decisions more than 20 years ago. But we, in the last uh, two decades, we know very well that we have to invest in metadata specialists and qualitative data. We have a new team of data stewards um, since a few months. Uh, they will help the researchers to make their data fair, uh, to understand what is happening, because that there is a big uh, gap still there um, that they can know what fair data is, that they do the right steps to uh, to get fair data out there and then to do text and data mining, mining themselves and using the sources out there. And uh, we ourselves in our library, we are looking for a business analyst for user-driven library and to analyze uh, text and data mine ourselves, our own data and the data that we, uh, that we have and that we get from commercial providers and things like that to get, give, uh, have a better insight in what happens in our library with the collections and to uh, to act on that and to make to give better services. So in short, um, text and data, data mining is certainly a part of our library services. Uh, it's still at an, an early stage. We still have a lot of things to do. But in the end, what we want to do is to make uh, life easier for researchers and provide them with tools and information that they can use throughout their research process. Uh, so that's in short where we stand now at Ghent University. And I now I give uh, uh, the floor uh, to Alex, who will tell you uh, more about uh, licenses and things like that.
Thanks, Inga. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Alex Fennon from the University of Birmingham here in uh, the sunny UK at the moment. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off if that's OK, because I'm looking at the screen at the moment and I um, might uh, look at that rather than um, the slides. So I'm going to turn my camera off um, and um, I'm going to start with a, a quick overview of um, what I'm going to cover in my session. So I'm going to talk about um, UK law um, and uh, the library's collection. Um, we'll look at the license review process that we take part in for our e-resource collections. And then we'll uh, talk about the uh, the TDM pilot project that we have um, underway here at Birmingham, look at the gaps, the triggers, and um, cover a little bit about project activity. And um, so just usefully to start then, um, it, it's useful to point out that at the moment the UK government has no plans to implement the DSM directive and um, that may change um, going forward but it's, uh, as it stands today um, there are no plans to implement the, um, the, the DSM directive into UK law. So if we look at UK law at the moment in um, 2014 we implemented a number of changes um, and that included the exception that's on the screen um, the text and data mining exception. Some of you may note the similarities between the text of the DSM, the two new exceptions. Um, however, one particular difference to highlight is there is no mention within the text of the UK exception about rights holders being able to protect the stability of their platforms. This is included within the preamble of the legislation, but actually didn't make it into the, the text itself. So for us, when the, implement, when the uh, exception was implemented in 2014, we focused on areas that I've highlighted there in bold. Um, legal access was a key point for us. Um, we interpreted that to mean that anything that we subscribe to, anything that we held within our physical collection um, would be available for, for mining activity. Of course, with the availability of information online, the rise of open access and repositories, as Inga touched upon, tools like unpaywalled, etc., um, which legally surface content, clearly there is huge potential for, for data mining activities. So when the, when the exception was implemented back in 2014, we were very hopeful and very excited that this had direct applicability to a large part of our research community. And we started to update our guidance and advocacy materials to ensure that we made explicit reference um, to this within our training and briefing sessions. So if we look briefly at the University of Birmingham collection, um, we have something like 2.87, 2.8 million um, print and electronic books, um, approximately 127,000 journals, um, and uh, 1,300 databases. In terms of our e-content, we have around 1,000 active licenses across 380, 390 different suppliers. And of course, the fees that we pay for those subscriptions range from a few hundred pounds into um, several hundred thousands and into um, millions as well. Alongside that activity, um, a few years ago, we took advantage of some of the offers that some suppliers were running and purchased a number of hard drives containing copies of online collections that were specifically designed to enable TDM to take place locally. We have about 25 to 30 of those, um, and they live in our research uh, reserve, which is pictured on the slide. Um, well, I think they're in the research reserve, um, gathering dust, probably. But we'll come back onto those um, a little bit later. So I mentioned um, at the start of the presentation the license review that we do. Um, so every time we purchase a new subscription or renew uh, an existing agreement for another period, the license documents are passed to my team for a review. We read through the documents to understand uh, our obligations. Those are the supplier that are contained within those agreements. It's important to us that we understand the license documents. We know how to terminate the agreement and we know what happens post termination. We know what to do if there's a license breach and who we need to speak to. And we can understand and see that our suppliers have an obligation to provide us with 24 seven access with a 99% uptime guarantee or that the maintenance window is between one and 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning, for example. 
And it's also important that we can see that the licensor is able to grant the license that they're trying to grant to us. Over and above those technical issues, however, um, we check to ensure that the license is fit for purpose in terms of granting access to our user community, to our staff, our students, those teachers, learners, and researchers engaged with the university in the UK, but also based at uh, overseas locations too. We look at the uses that the license grant us and to our students in relation to teaching. Simple things like the ability, their ability to, to save and to print extracts, to use the content within teaching materials, whether that's delivered live in a lecture theatre, whether it's recorded or it's made available via our virtual learning environment. We also look to ensure that the license grants us the ability to support our users with disabilities by providing and producing accessible copies. In terms of research, we look um, to again ensure that we can provide accessible copies, that we can, um, the researchers are able to save, uh, to print extract articles from those collections that we subscribe to, um, and more importantly, uh, and more recently, the ability to text and data miners become um, involved in that part of um, that review. We also consider those license, those uh, library specific reuses. So again, accessible copies, the ability to supply copies um, and interlibrary loans. Now, of course, most of that is covered by exceptions. Um, we know that the UK and EU law includes exceptions that allow some of those uses, but it's nice um, to see that those exceptions are, or those uses are clearly written and expressly included within the terms of the licenses. We do frequently spot license clauses that appear to contradict with the legislation, and we see clauses that even prevent users from saving or printing parts for their personal studies, or preventing libraries from supplying interlibrary loan copies. Where we spot issues like this, we work with the suppliers to clarify and to remove those conflicts, or at least to ensure that local copyright law is recognised. Turning on to TDM specifically then, we do see publishers providing separate addendums covering TDM, and again, we would review those in the same way that we would review a main licence to check that it's fit for purpose. So what we've started seeing over the last few months is um, those licenses uh, and those addendums in, relating to, in relation to TDM is an obligation on the universities, on the researchers to provide information to the supplier about planned uh, mining activity, to almost request permission to mine the content. Some of this is light touch, it's requested uh, to do rather than a formal license obligation so that the suppliers are aware of the activity. But others place significant and substantial demands to provide full details of the research projects, the researchers involved, and actually to await for approval before the mining activity takes place. Those examples seem to be a process which could be a barrier to mining activity. And under the exceptions in the UK and in the EU coming in under DSM, they could be um, unenforceable. And it's a worrying trend. And while I understand the need for collaboration, for partnerships and for the mutual benefits that, that can be, those can drive, and we have evidence of that ourselves here at Birmingham, there is a barrier. And if there is a barrier, then that causes a problem. And I think some of this has been um, prevalent in TDM for a long time. If we think back about API licenses and things like that, again, there was a requirement to um, request permission um, before the, the key API key has been provided. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on to talk about the TDM project at Birmingham and, and just look um, really about some of the, the, the triggers that caused us to, to start to explore this in more detail. So back in 2015, we were joined by a, a senior professor who brought with her a project involving analysis of newspaper archives and Charles Dickens novels. It was the first real instance of a TDM project that we had encountered in library services. And we were specifically asked to um, support the project, support access to the data, um, and to help the project get back underway um, when it moved the institution. And it was really the first real example, the first tangible example that we had of a TDM project. Luckily for us, the project had been long established. 
it had been underway at another institution, so many of those issues were addressed already. We just had to get up to speed to enable it to restart. And actually, what we had to do was to, to move our ideas out from the, the theoretical um, thoughts around what text and data mining might look like to actually into the reality um, and the practical. So those issues about access to databases, licenses, permissions, security, all had to become reality. And that was the real driver for us to get involved in uh, text and data mining activity. Following on from that, um, we became aware that lots of our researchers across uh, campus do research in uh, big data, in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, all types of research activity in that field. We know that they use textual analysis techniques, information retrieval techniques, and numerous other, other terms that essentially involve um, text and data mining, but they might call it via a different name. And actually, over the last few weeks and months, um, we've had queries from across all five of our colleges. So from the College of Arts and Law, the College of Social Sciences, Electronic, uh, and, oh, sorry, Engineering and Physical Sciences, Life and Environmental Sciences, and um, Medicine and Dental Sciences. And the range of queries that we've received are not only from um, those experienced profs well-versed in this technique, but from... Um, early career researchers from PhD students as well. And they're all looking to engage in text and data mining activity because they see the benefits that it could offer to um, their research. Earlier on in the presentation, I mentioned the hard drives. Um, through the work of one of these research projects, the, the interest in those drives has actually increased uh, over the last um, year or so, to the extent where we've had requests for access to those drives. Of course, we're talking about physical hard drives that are sat on a shelf in our research reserve. Um, it's not the best or most cutting edge way to provide access to the data. Um, and of course, there are issues around security, data loss, the loss of the drive, damage to the drive itself. And of course, when the drive is uh, loaned out to one individual, then obviously nobody else can access that data set as well. More fundamentally than that, when we started to supply the drives, when we opened the box, we realized that the drives were supplied with a US plug. Um, so we had to um, buy converters so that it would work in the UK, which is another minor but hidden cost of data mining activity. So from talking to a research community, um, it was clear to us that there was a growing interest in the area. And as I said, we had requests and queries from the full range of um, researchers from PhD through to, to senior profs. They can all see those benefits. But what it was apparent was that there was a skills gap and that was emerging from that. And while the technology has evolved in recent years, um, to remove barriers to enable text and data mining, some of those barriers do still remain. For every active mining project we explored with researchers, there were others that fell back to manual methods of analysis because the team, the researchers involved, lacked the skills, resources, and the time to engage with new methods to learn new techniques. You probably can't see the slide, the, the code on the right-hand side, but to me, it might as well be written in Klingon or Esperanto. I can't read or understand it. And I think that's a common problem with researchers um, engaging in this space. The tools that are used in mining do require a shift in mindset and a shift in skill set. Coding languages are just that. They are languages that need learning and understanding. Some will not struggle to use those tools offered by the suppliers or the various projects that are releasing tools to support activity. Others, however, will be intimidated by the very thought of coding. In even where a researcher is able to query an API, other issues arise. Are they suitable? Are they stable? Are they sufficient? Do they provide access to the full data set, or do they just query a limited subset of data? Many APIs are chargeable, and they come with those license conditions that we mentioned earlier on. In a world of, of fair, data and research data mandates in the reproducibility crisis in the drive for open science, how do those license restrictions impact on researcher activity? 
I think there was a trade-off there between the convenience and the ease of use to use the ease of use in the ready-made tools versus the, the need and the ability to develop custom tools to suit a particular research audience. And I think the same is true for our researchers uh, as it is for our librarians. If we as librarians want to support our researchers, then we need to engage in this activity too. We need to be able to, to query APIs, to, to run the code, to be able to help and to support um, our researchers. It may be niche at the moment, may be limited to the digital humanities, to, um, to the, uh, the, the computing guys, but actually it's going to become more mainstream. So the question here, the challenge is how do we support not only our research community, but also our staff? And it was clear from those early discussions that there was a gap um, and the researchers needed the time, the space and the support to engage in those new techniques. And if they can't, then is there a space for libraries to step in to provide that support to ensure that research questions do not go unanswered? And it's safe to say that from our experience here at Birmingham, we do have some unanswered research questions. So moving on from, from skills, we also identified a tools gap. Um, um, the researchers would talk to us about the range of tools that they use to complete their research. Many of them use third party software products, products that were well established within their discipline, while some were able to uh, and happy to create their own tools, either using uh, Python or R or something similar. And some of those tools were open source, openly licensed, um, others were third party with all rights reserved, um, out of the box solutions. What we found was that there was no real consistency about the tools that were used and actually what was effective. When you speak to one researcher about one tool in a particular discipline, you go and speak to another one in a different discipline and they would be absolutely scathing of that particular product, surprised that, that we would that, that researchers would still use it. So it was really variable. At the same time of talking to our researchers about the tools that they used, we became aware of developments on the publisher side. The publishers had been offering hard drives um, for a number of years, but increasingly the prevalence of APIs, of XML feeds or downloads become um, more common and more frequent. Of course, when you're engaging with a, with a publisher and you're obtaining access to these content, the licenses um, and obligations and agreements need to be signed before you would grant access. And what we'd find, as I mentioned earlier on, from those licenses, there is little consideration of actually what the exceptions in law allow us to do. But of course, if you want access to the data, you need to sign the agreement. And increasingly, what we're starting to see now over recent months is suppliers actually building platforms. So they would um, invest in solutions which incorporate the data and the tools to enable text and data mining. They're delivering platforms specifically aimed at researchers and miners. And these are new services which are being rolled out um, as we speak. But of course, they're chargeable services which are not included within our subscriptions. And for libraries, such tools are not normally within the scope of our normal collection policies. Okay, so we've looked at skills and we've looked at tools. Um, the other gap that we've identified is the infrastructure gap. Um, when you're engaged in supporting researchers or, or to facilitate data mining activity, there is a need to ensure that the data that you're investigating, that you're analyzing, um, needs to be stored. And of course, servers and interfaces are not free of charge. When you're considering issues such as remote access, authentication, data security, data breaches, preservation, compliance with funder mandates or open science objectives, there are considerable issues around the infrastructure which need to be in place to support mining activities. Of course, Inga mentioned um, uh, metadata and, and issues associated with that. But if we look at OCR, um, there are huge questions about uh, storing and facilitating the storage of data. And of course, if you come back to the legal issues, 
there are concerns about storing the data when the analysis is complete. The TDM exceptions allow the research activity to take place, the mining to occur, but then what happens when it's completed? And also, what if we were building a mining environment? What if libraries started harvesting data in the anticipation of a researcher coming out and saying, I want to investigate this? Could we start doing that um, using our subscribed content um, to facilitate data mining? Is that within the scope of the exceptions? And of course, with rapid internet connections, with stable APIs and with store cloud storage, do libraries, do institutions even need to supply local solutions anymore? Some interesting questions. Okay, so all of that basically led us to a situation where we needed to, to explore this in more detail. We needed the time to be able to, to, to devote to thinking about some of this. Hi, so, Alex. Could you start to round up? Thank yes. you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we started to do was explore um, a, a, a pilot project with one particular data set, and we, we, which we knew was in demand. So we, um, we mounted that on our research infrastructure, which our researchers use to store all their data on. Um, and we are in the process of testing the uh, mechanisms to, to grant access to that. Um, Hopefully that will work and that will um, enable us to circulate links and start promoting that activity to our research communities. Um, the second phase of the project is to spend some time looking at what's already out there in the community. So looking at those third party supplier publisher platforms that are already there, what are the costs involved in subscribing to those and do we actually want to do that? We'll also re-engage with our researchers in a focus group. What do they really want? What is or isn't possible for them legally, technically? Um, in terms of skills and also what's possible for the library to supply. And one of the things we've got our eyes on is potentially that text and data mining environment. So providing the storage, the tools, and possibly the data to enable text and data mining to take place. As I said, it might not be needed, um, but it's certainly something that we're going to explore over the next few weeks and months um, so that researchers can input their data into a secure place on our network and then use the tools that are available and supplied to them. Um, it's early days in terms of our research project, um, our, our pilot project, um, but hopefully we'll be um, making progress on that quickly. Um, that's it. Thanks very much. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Inga and Alex. That was very interesting indeed. Um, I can see a couple of... Uh, questions in in the chat um but if if i can just start off with a particular question um at, aimed at inga I, inga i understand about five years ago Ghent did a survey on looking at the skills that uh members of staff as well as as researchers uh needed or, and and one of the things there was um skills relating to data management I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit to that and how you how that has sort of led into more data mining activities um, at, at Ghent. Uh, yeah, five years ago we did. Uh, well, it, it's even six years ago, I think, but something like that. Um, we, we did the survey among researchers and staff, so there were two separate things actually. Um, now, if you look at the researchers and students and management. There was uh, quite uh, a big uh, gap between, uh, well, the, 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 the skills to do fair data management, for example, were not there. It wasn't called fair at, at that day, but uh, people didn't really know what it was about. So um, for years, we have uh, been working towards establishing a data steward team. And it's only since this fall that we have such a team of six people for um a university and the one of the, the tasks is to to make sure that researchers are up to pace with what fair data management is and what possible reuse uh, cases there are and um, in some disciplines they don't need our help there but in many they still do so um, we hope in the next few years to really accelerate uh, excessively uh, 
this uh, skill in our university and text and data mining purposes uh, because our data stewards will be there to help our researchers. But as I said, they, it's just since a half a year that we have this team. And uh, did we design our own survey at that time? Yes, we did. Um, and it, it was really an internal survey. So uh, I have to look at the results that we could share. Um, but we use it afterwards in the, in, in the Flemish um, survey, of which I can say some, share something in the, the five Flemish universities, where about the same questions were asked, so that we saw um, the field in Flanders, and this was part of a white paper that induced us to ask uh, a government to uh, help us to establish data stewards teams, and uh, that's in... in in that environment, uh, since December, we have a Flemish Open Science Board in Flanders with budget to, uh, and one of the things that we want to do there is have data stewards in all the universities to help researchers with these research questions, data questions. Wow, that's very coordinated and very impressive. Um, I can see a question aimed at Alex there. So is information about the licenses at Birmingham stored in a specific system where various members of staff can access it? Um, or, or presumably the opposite of that uh, is um, very few people can actually access the licenses. So they, so they wouldn't know what the prohibitions and terms and conditions are. Okay, so uh, we use Alma as our library management system here, and we use Primo as our catalog. Um, and as part of the interface between Primo and Alma, there is the ability to surface license terms. So what we do is we include those usage terms within the Primo record so that there is a, a button that says something like show license information. And that includes um, very brief information, extracts from the license, key terms that we populate those fields with. Um, one of those is users um, and some of the uses that are permitted. And there is a text and data mining box that we've added to those um, to those uh, those fields. So information about text and data mining is surfaced via our, our catalogue for e-journal extracts. Yes. I, I guess um, it's very important, and I've just put it in, in the chat, to remember that licences um, under the, the new articles in the Digital Single Market Directive, licences cannot remove the right to do data mining if you do data mining in line with this new copyright exception. So in a sense, you, if you are doing data mining, you don't have to worry uh, about what the licence allows or, or doesn't allow. And one question that comes up quite a lot is, well, what happens if the the contract is in say US law well that doesn't matter you're you're based in uh, the EU and therefore it's EU copyright law um, that matters and EU copyright law tells tells us that licenses cannot remove this new right to do data mining so I, I, I think it's Im important to, to, to remember that in this respect, the licenses in a sense are not, are not so important. I think that's right, Ben, but we should also be aware that some of the license terms do go over and above the exception and grant extra rights, extra abilities to use extracts from data mining that the, that the exceptions do not give us. So it is useful to read through and just double check those license terms to see if there is anything extra um, over and above the exceptions. And of course, where you've got a legal document that conflicts with law, then it's always useful to check and to just reconfirm and to reestablish that law does override those license terms. Yeah, good point. We've got a question here from Rob. Uh, how does TDM relate to data? Oops, sorry, people have just sort of disappeared. Um, how does TDM relate to database rights, substantial content extraction? So again, the 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 new uh, exception um, creates an exception to the database right, the sui generis database rights, which um, it, it you know 
again, has restrictions around how much can be extracted, but but the the new law um, allows extractions and reutilizations to any extent required for the purposes of text and data mining. As Alex raised there, how you share the results is the law is silence, and and um, that's kind of one of the real weaknesses, I think, of 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 the new law. I think that's right, Ben. Um, in terms of databases specifically, what you see in some of the licenses is actually a, a clause that says that any database rights, any IP, any copyright that arises from TDM outputs is owned by the institution, by the researcher, um, and they treat that separately to the ownership of the content, um, the, the original source material itself. Oh, that, so yes, we had a question kind of further up the flow about about that. So that's interesting. So you're saying, Alex, there that the publishers say that any output, of some publishers, sorry, some publishers say that any outputs in terms of derived data are the intellectual property rights of that researcher or that individual. Yeah, that's right. So the database that's derived from that that mining activity would be owned under the the normal institutional practice that's interesting so with, uh, without that you 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 i i think you basically end up with a database of information that has different rights your own rights as well as the rights if there is any kind of copyright or database right in in um coming from from the publisher so sort of that derived data has a rather complex um and unclear intellectual property position but that's great if some publishers are clarifying that they they will not assert um any intellectual property rights in in that derived data absolutely Are there any frameworks or programs dedicated to librarians' training and skills gaining? That's an excellent question. Any um, one of the things that we've been looking at recently is um, software, uh, the library carpentry stuff. Um, whether that has any specific interest, that's probably on the on the technical side, probably more that Inga can talk about. Um, in terms of the copyright and licensing side, um, probably not much specific stuff aimed at a, a TDM at this stage. No, uh, if I look here in, in Flanders, we, we, we don't, first of all, we don't have a, a library education on higher, uh, on master level, for example, here in, in Flanders. So that's already a problem. So what we do within our the Flemish Association of Libraries, uh, VVBAD, we try to um, accommodate that in workshops and in, uh, in seminars to educate ourselves, let's say. So this is really something, this is really um, a bit of an issue, a, um, an attention point, something, a challenge um, that we have to share our information among ourselves. And uh, we don't really have like official modules or things that we can can follow at the moment so um um the if you look in the chat Lieber will uh publish soon uh, a paper working title uh how can libraries support text and data mining in there we have some links to uh op if you go onto the open minted open minded website there are links to an online course about text and data mining. And then we also provide a couple of links to um, companies as well as not-for-profit organizations that offer kind of services in, in, in this area. So one service that we refer to, for example, is uh, an organization called Content Mine. So they, they have tools and they also do training. Um, I, well, we're 10 seconds away from, um, from, from the end of 
the webinar. I'm just looking through to see if we've got any final questions that jump out at me. I there was a question further up from Manuela about TDM and CC by uh, ND content. Um, the exception include that non no contract override, so um, you could mine uh, ND content in the same way that you can with all rights reserved content. Yeah, and if you mine, you make no derivatives, actually. Yeah. I would say. Yeah, that's actually, that's a good point. But then the, um, then, but then Creative Commons licenses are subject to um, exceptions in copyright law. So my, my initial reaction to that is, it doesn't matter what CC by ND allows or disallows because Creative Commons licenses are 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 um, you know subject, as it were, to to copyright law. And of course, copyright law, as we know now, in regards to this exception, trumps uh, any license. So um, both ways, that that's not a problem now. And by both ways, I mean, from the license perspective, they allow uh, copyright law to trump the license. And of course, the new digital single market articles, they uh, article three aimed at research organizations, they uh, take precedence over, over the license. So right, so I think we're done. Thank, I'd just like to thank our speakers, uh, Inga and Alex, very, very much indeed for a fascinating uh, hour. So uh, yes, people are sending lots and lots of claps. Um, and, and yeah, as I said, we will circulate to all registrants uh, the paper and it will go on uh, Libra website and also check out uh, what is on there now, which is about how publishers are being extremely slow to respond to libraries where content is being blocked as a result of uh, people undertaking text and data mining. So, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, goodbye. Happy to be here. See you, See you next Thanks time. Thanks very much, everybody.